Now then, listener, I want to let you know that my book, What a Flanker, is available now in paperback. It's had some great feedback. Rugby World said, what a flanker, what a book. The Telegraph described it as explosive. The Sun said, not for the faint of heart. If you haven't got a copy now, order yours in paperback. Or get it in ebook or audiobook read by me. Thanks for your support. Now on with the show. Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast series two. Now my guest today is the only athlete to hold two Olympic titles in the triathlon event, winning gold medals in the 2012 and 2016 Olympic Games, and is the only man to have won Olympic gold whilst going into an event as favourite for the title. He's also a two-time triathlon world champion in 2009-2011, a two-time world champion 2011-2014, a four-time European champion 2010, 11, 14 and 19, and the 2014 Commonwealth champion. It's, of course, Alistair Brownlee. How are you, sir? Good, thank you very much. Thanks for having me and um, how are you doing? Mate, I'm great. Do you know what? I, I, I've interviewed quite a few people, so I, I, I've done... This is series two. We've done 18 and I have never read an introduction like that to anybody like the amount of stuff you've won is like breathtaking please say that you have taken a moment to appreciate how good that is <laughs> uh as well you know you're kind of only as good as your your last race and your next race aren't you so um yeah i've, I've had a very long career um or it's every day well it feels very long anyway and um been at it a long time and yeah it's um it's been good and, and Ultimately, I'm very happy <laughs> with what I've achieved, and um, yeah, anything uh, I, I always say, anything that I, I achieve now is just a, a good bonus, really. Because <laughs> you know, when, one of my biggest regrets, and I, I've had not even kind of you know one percent of the career that you've that you've had, but I, I was always on to the next thing. So I was always in the pursuit of kind of trying to get better. I would always focus on kind of the, the, the negatives about things that had happened and I'd want to go out and rectify it and get back out training. And then obviously before you know it, I'd retired. Mm-hmm. And then I, one of my regrets was is not celebrating the, the even the, the big victories or the little victories. When you've achieved these things, you know, post, obviously you're right, you're only as good as your last kind of performance, but post these moments, did you allow yourself to actually have a minute and go, do you know what? I, I couldn't, I, you, know, I, I could, you could always do better, but I've, I'm happy. Yeah, well, yeah, I completely agree. Um, especially in my younger part of my career, you know, I would, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd turn up, do a race, you know, literally win the World Series, best race in the world and uh, move on. I always had a bit of a rule that I thought um, I should kind of celebrate every time I won a World Series, um, and in triathlon, World Series is the very top. You know, there's seven or eight of them a year. Um, and when I won the first one, I was like, "Yeah, you know, I've got a, a massive deal." You know, celebration, and it's probably not quite on uh, maybe on your level of kind of celebrations, but you know, go out for a few pints or whatever. Anyway, I ended up winning like 25 of the things. So uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it is really easy to come blasé, but I definitely had. Um, the kind of insight you know it's a massive um cliche that you you do the olympic games and you know if you win um you you cross the finish line it's all a blur and literally your life is mapped out for you for whatever five days and actually five months you're just running around from one event to the next it's super busy you know you're uh up early in the morning going to events and this and that And and it is tough actually to get time to appreciate it I was, I'm immensely lucky, obviously, that I've um, been running down the finish line uh, to win the Olympic Games twice. And um, the second time in Rio, I had time to think, actually, no, um, you know, you didn't really get a chance to enjoy it and take it in last time. Make sure you do this time. And um, yeah, I, um, I could never say quite how appreciative I am, obviously, to, be, to have done that twice and the second time to be able to take a breath and have the insight that yeah it's probably not going to happen again and doesn't happen to many people so make sure I make the most of it how did you second time around do it because uh, you know I never really when I used to score tries it was such a rarity I think you get more like to find hen's teeth before I scored but if I did in my younger days I used to celebrate when I was older it was such a shock that I'd done it I forgot to celebrate and I and I thought after I was like fuck why did I do, didn't do that you've obviously had the beauty of winning all those kind of things then winning the Olympics and then you know, going back, getting another chance to it. What did you change? Like, did you go, oh, Christ, I need to stop here, wave to this person, I'm going to smile, I'm not going to go, you know, what did you think was going to do differently? 
Yeah, I don't think any of that. It's more just, uh, and it maybe sounds a bit abstract, but and I don't mean it in terms of like mindfulness, but kind of presence. You know, like uh, I think in, in London, um, I was lucky. Maybe I had like a ten second lead or something, which is quite a long way, really. But still, you're thinking just cross that line, just cross that line. And I think in the end, like I grabbed the flag, crossed the line, and I was absolutely knackered. You know, collapsed, and that was that. In Rio, I, I actually had quite a, a big buffer um, to actually John Ewer was coming second. And so I knew the race was done with kind of 2K to go, to be honest. And um, coming to the lap, I was like, obviously, you know, you try and not let yourself, uh, your focus wander. So until the last kind of 500 meters, no focus on everything you're doing, get uh, get to the last 500 meters. And at that point, I think I had time to grab a few flags, slow right down and kind of walk the last 50 meters after doing some high fives and and just, yeah, just take it in, you know, just be thankful that, um, yeah, the race had gone well, the preparation had gone well, all, all that um, stress and everything else that goes into the preparation um, had, had worked out. Be thankful for all the people that had helped me get there and, um, yeah, just enjoy the moment in the sun, literally on um, triathlon. It's always a blue carpet before you get to the finish line. So coming up the, the blue carpet. Why a blue in, carpet? In front of the I've got no idea actually why it's a blue carpet. Um, it just always is. <laughs> surely, surely, as the most winningest person in like triath triathlon history, you can demand. I think it's time we rolled out a red carpet, maybe a gold carpet. You know, I, don't, mm. I can't imagine a blue cut. You know, yeah. not really my style. But, um, <laughs> no, I do. I, I do. I do actually have a bit of the blue carpet from the London Olympics uh, framed, which is um, yeah, on a. It's actually not on a wall yet. It's kind of behind me down here somewhere, but it is going to go on the wall because uh, it's kind of a cool thing to have. That's amazing. But who, who nicked that? Do you cut that yourself or do they give that to you? Uh, well, no, the guy that organised the event, um, actually, you know, I've known him and uh, my manager uh, has known him for years. And I think it, it was only like last year or a couple of years ago, he said, yeah, I've actually got tons of this carpet left. Would you like some? Uh, so anyway, he gave some to my manager who then got it framed and gave it to me as a present. So, uh, yeah, I've got a framed bit of blue carpet. And obviously to most people, um, when it goes on the wall, they're going to be like, why have you got a dirty, because it's a dirty bit of carpet, effectively. You know, I say carpet, it's not really, you know, it's just like cheap, I don't know, whatever lining kind of thing. Yeah, matting. Uh, so I got a dirty bit of blue matting on it framed on my wall. But um, yeah, like, I, I was lucky enough to do um, in um, mm. 2007. We did some stuff with like the SBS um, and we got shown into their, kind of their mess. And they had like just you know a bit of something blown up, a bit of, you know just stuff that you wouldn't <laughs> really recognise or mm. want to necessarily hang on a wall. But it all has a special memory. And that for you, like your you know your first Olympic gold in your hometown. I think I think it's amazing. I mean, I still think we disagree on the carpet, but you've already said twice now <laughs> that that's not my style and I wouldn't celebrate like you. So you've obviously pigeonholed me as a complete like Southern lunatic as yours and you're a more, more humble kind of <laughs> humble Northerner who's like, I'm not really interested in like anything flash, James. Uh, you know, I, I go out for a few quiet yeah, hours. Sorry, that's not my, um, not my intention. <laughs> no, 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 I love it. I love it. I am exactly, everything you think about me, I'm exactly what you think. I'm going to, you know, you know, you're probably very, you know, very humble, very hardworking. I'm an absolute gobshite. Everything that you think I would be. Um, but I'm, I'm interested when you said about your, you're sort of letting your hair down. Um, what, what does that mean for someone who dedicates so much of their life to kind of being, you know, so focused? Does it, is it a couple of beers or by the end of it, are you standing on the bar with Jaeger bombs and, you know, with the gold medals on? How, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I have to spend quite a lot of my uh, life being quite diligent and uh, training hard. Like, you know, today I've done over six hours of training. So, you know, you kind of got to recover from that and be ready to go again the next day. So, yeah, uh, I do have to look after myself. But, um, yeah, I, I definitely have been known to, um, especially after some of the big events, um, yeah, let my hair down, which is a couple of pints and, yeah, probably probably Jaeger bombs uh, a bit later on in the evening <laughs> that's the reason I wanted to talk to you is obviously you're you know you're clearly an, an, an incredible athlete and, and, and a fascinating guy and what I really wanted to explore with you was kind of your your mindset your approach I know you've got a new book um, coming out called relentless I think that's out in July I'd love to hear a little bit about that but I kind of want to start from the beginning I know we've dotted around at the start but I'm, I'm just so fascinated I'm not even sure where to begin myself but I think it's good to start when you were kind of younger 
were you always this competitive, like this dedicated, or was there something that turned you into into this? I think at the base of it, yeah, I think I've always been this competitive. Um, I remember uh, kind of that anecdote I, I, I tell quite a lot. I remember being really young, like six, five or six years old, and uh, my mum had been kind of a competitive, you know, kind of county level swimmer, and she had a bag of um, medals, like, uh, so in the area we live, you know, Leeds and District, whatever, silver medal, 50 metre backstroke, and um, uh, Airedale and Wharfdale District, you know, medal, loads of these medals. And uh, I was kind of fascinated by the medals, and um, my, I had some neighbours and, um, and and her, she, they, they told me that, right, if you go to the swimming club, um, you can win medals like that. And that was it, you know, straight away. Um, yeah, I want to win medals. Uh, I want to go to the swimming club. And I want to train. And, um, you know, almost probably I've averaged, you know, going swimming a number of times every week since then, since I was like six years old. Um, and that was kind of the start of uh, my sporting career. And very soon afterwards, um, my dad, who was uh, more into running, uh, cross-country running, you know, I was doing a bit of cross-country at school, yeah, you can uh, run cross country races, um, and I was absolutely useless at it. the first just lead school, so lead schools for whatever under ten, under eleven boys, and I'm like six or seven. I came 299. You know, according to my dad, looked like I was about to have a heart attack. Bright red. Um, yeah, going so slowly up the hills. I think I might as well have been walking. Um, but yeah, I think I did those competitions for three years after that, and every single time, you know, all I wanted to do was get better so that kind of innate I think it is just innate competitiveness and um, that's still there I can I can kind of not be very fit or not be very into it and uh, put myself in a position where yeah it is competitive like a hard swim session or something I might be racing Johnny or one of the other guys I train with and, and straight away that's it you know I can uh, really push myself oh, so even if you're not you're not mentally there or you are so you're in a bit of an off season as soon as someone says right uh, you know, we're on, you You can just put yourself in that place to do it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. As soon as it's on, um, I'll give it a go. Even if I'm, <laughs> even if I've got no chance of coming out on top, I'll I'll give it a go, definitely. But I, I love I love that, because even now, so I've been retired kind of a couple of years, and actually, one of the things I really enjoy that I've had to put into my training, my body's sort of slowly falling apart a bit, is I always have to, a couple of times a week, end myself, you know, whether that's, you know, ver I, mean, I can't run mm. anymore, unfortunately, but I mean, I wasn't great, <laughs> wasn't great at running anyway, but like, mm. you know, things like Versa Climber, Ski Erg, you know, body weight circuits, all that kind of stuff until you're absolutely out on your feet. And, you know, I don't need to do it, but I, I mentally need to do it. I like going to that kind of, that place. I mean, I don't enjoy mm. it much when I'm there, but I, I, I do it. It's interesting that you, because I tried cross country at school um, and I don't want to, you know, and I, I, the first time I did it, I joined the school crush and I somehow came like third Right, and I really work for it because mm. they're competitive. And then they put me in the cross country club, and I was like, I fucking hated it. Like I hated it. I was <laughs> like, I did it. I thought I could do it once. I didn't. Nobody. I didn't want to do it as a thing. I, I love the fact that most people were being put off coming two hundred, but you went. Oh, actually, I'll go. I'll have another go at that. And that was all just because you wanted to win medals, or, or because you just didn't do well. You were like, right, I'll come back and do better. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, it, it's a long time ago now, like twenty twenty five years or something. Uh, but I um, so I can't entirely remember, but yeah, I think so. I, I had this kind of just desire. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to win. I wanted to win medals. I wanted to get better. I wanted to, yeah, push myself. And yeah, I, I, and I think that was it. And um, yeah, I can't even. I think. Um, I think to be honest, like you'll kind of know that kind of desire. Let's call it motivation. Um, kind of changes and like migrates and becomes kind of multifactorial, you know, I probably started off wanting to win medals, probably at points I just wanted to beat my mate at other points, I definitely just wanted to beat Johnny and be better than him um, at points, um, yeah, I was just in, enjoyed the training and motivated to train hard and um, was motivated by getting better every day and I think that is one of the things with motivation, you know, it it's kind of, it's not a single thing, it's you, you know, in, in my case, I'm training basically for a race in two months' time that I not, may or may not be on. You know, I'm not motivated every day um, and every hour of every training session by that race. I might be motivated to because I enjoy training and or because it's habitual, it's by my job, and then I might be motivated because, yeah, I'm 
training next to someone and that competitive instinct kicks in or I might be motivated by something else. And if all that fails, yeah, you have to motivate yourself by the goal, which is the race at the end of it. I mean, I was actually going to ask you this. So I, I, people ask me all the time and, they talk, and I talk to different people about motivation. And actually, I think what you're describing in my mind is mental strength because motivation for me is something that like comes and goes. Like if you're super motivated, you're like, yeah, I feel great. And you get up and you go out and it's freezing cold and you go and train. If you're not motivated, then people give up because motivation comes and goes. I think everything that you said is like mental strength because you've got the determination or the mental strength into it. Whatever is that driving factor, you put that hat on to then go out and, and own it. Whereas, you know, most people translate motivation is like, oh, I, I, you know, if they didn't have the competition, that would break them. They don't then have another alternative. Mm. Um, I don't know if you ever looked at it like that because because one of the things I, I I was going to use the word what motivates you because when we before we the call started I asked you you know how are you and you were like well it's actually quite nice because a couple of days of sunshine and one of the things I could imagine is doing mm. what you're doing in the cold would be hanging on an on an unparalleled scale and you must open the door some morning especially if you're doing six hours of training and think fuck this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I, exactly uh, as you described, I would um, probably define what you define as motivation. I say that as willpower, you know, the uh, the standard, I'm sat on the sofa now, you know, on a, on a relatively cold winter's evening, and I've got to go down the gym, and I've got to, you know, you've got to prize yourself off the sofa, get out the door, you know, get your kit, get down the gym. That's willpower, and you've only got so much willpower, like a bucket of it. So really, I kind of flip that on its head a lot of the time and go, what what can I do to make sure that I'm only using as little willpower as possible? Because I've only got a bucket of that. That even you know everyone has to use sometimes. Um, like you said, if it's a crappy day, um, then and you've got to get out the door, or you you know got to get an extra half hour in, or whatever. That at that point, I've got to use willpower. But out of a combination of training with other people, you know, being motivated by the social aspects and the competitive aspect and seeing your friends, um, making it habitual, I get up in the morning, the alarm goes, I'm going swimming, that's part of my life, my routine, I'm not giving myself the option, um, making it easy, so all my kit's ready, you know, the bike's ready, um, there's no excuses for for not doing the training, um, removing all the barriers effectively, I think you'd say to that, you know, really commonsensical things um, to make training as easy and to use as little willpower as possible um yeah i think that's the answer but yeah sometimes it's tough um there was a day uh you know last week i just kind of felt like for um obviously i've been at home this whole winter normally i'd spend quite a bit of time in spain this time of year you know don't feel sorry for me i'm not asking for that but you know going out every day um training four five six hours and you know, it's cold for a few weeks and then it's wet for a few weeks. And then last week we had wind and wet. And you, I just thought I spent all week getting outside, getting wet, getting blown around by the wind uh, and cold. And I've just had enough of this. And yeah, it does. It does definitely um, grind you down. But then you get a nice day like we've had today and yesterday. And you're like, yeah, it's fantastic. This is, you know, I genuinely enjoy it riding around talking to my friends. And um, yeah, it's 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 good i've never thought about it actually with the with this the willpower thing and the bucket analogy i think you're, you're right you know, I, i'd never thought of it like that because you're right you, you do have a you know put motivation willpower whatever you want to call it you do have a limited amount of that before it fades and then you have to sort of mm. rely on utilizing other factors uh, do you ever use things like music as a tool i don't know you know because you seem i mean there's some of your i followed you on instagram and i was looking at some of the photos you obviously have a training partner i, I want to come on to talking about when you, you know, train with your brother and stuff um or have done in the past do, do you ever switch off the music because because when i if i'm struggling with something say i'm not not feeling great well, as soon as i put my music on on a you know on a specific playlist i made i'm into game day mm. mode i'm into training mode i'll get that shit done do you do anything like that or do you still just rely on interaction with other people? I'd say most of the time it's interacting with other people. Um, I do do a bit of training on my own. Um, and when I do train on my own, sometimes, yeah, I might have a combination of podcasts and music, um, depending. I mean, I spend quite a lot of time. I mean, I might go out and ride my bike for four hours and it's kind of nice to mix it up, maybe listen to a bit of music, listen to a podcast, um, only if I'm my, on my own. Um, and obviously during a lot of coronavirus, I've did a, did a lot more training on my own than I would do normally. Um, and now, obviously, we can go out and train and uh, talk and interact with more people, which is way better. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's the answer. I don't 
I don't, don't massively listen to music, um, and even then, probably only if I was doing a, a relatively um, just an easy session. If, I, if I'm doing a hard session, I'll, I'll normally just have nothing and, and be with my own thoughts, push myself. Would you say, because I have, I <laughs> sound that weird, like the voice in your head, you always have those voice that says you need to train and you need to rest, or I certainly do, you know, and, the, and, the, and sometimes the voice that says stay on the sofa, you've done the work, you mm. trained three hours today, you did the swim, you're fine, right? For someone at your level, do you have that, do you have that kind of thing? Um, and have you ever, if you, have you ever given in and sort of come, gone, oh, I'm going to cut this short and then had a meltdown and had to go back out and <laughs> do it again? Uh, to answer that last point first, um, no, I've never gone, yeah, I'm going to cut this short and uh, gone out the door to do, uh, then gone out the door because I felt guilty. Um, no, I haven't had that happen to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the time you're thinking you're tired, is it the best thing to do to do more training today? I work on a very kind of structured week, um, basically a, a training week that I've at the outline of that I developed over years and years and have almost stuck to relatively religiously for the last 10 years. Um, and that week was really of my design, actually, you know, Monday, it's this Tuesday, it's that Wednesday, it's that. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, the design kind of works because how you fit in like intensity and long aerobic around each other. Um, and so that means like every day, you know, I wake up on a Wednesday, I know it's an aerobic day, I know I'm doing a long swim, a medium bike, a medium run and a long bike. Um, I kind of know the order. And so I guess, A, it's structure. And I think all athletes know that structure or everyone knows that structure is really important. Um, and, you know, that kind of accountability. Um, and, and also just the week just allows me um, to kind of know where I am um, and, yeah, to just know what's coming up, which I guess is structure as well. Um, so, so one of the, when you said about the, the the you haven't felt that. I mean, is that you've never you've never gone out for a session and gone and gone actually I can't finish this off quit, or you're saying that you've just never gone quit and gone back out again? Have you just never quit on a session? No, I've definitely quit on sessions. Um, yeah, very, you know, for various reasons. I've I've gone out and I'm supposed to be riding for four hours and. I've got an hour in and it's like horizontal snow and I just thought flipping out like I'm, I'm not carrying on in this um, and and turned around and gone home and missed half of the ride I guess you know that happens relatively regularly um, and the other thing is yeah when I've been doing a hard session and I'm just thinking I can't do this today you know I've, I'm on my bike I can't push the power that I should be able to do or I'm running can't you know run as fast as I should be able to or swimming yeah something's wrong um and yeah that happens i mean that doesn't happen too much my kind of philosophy for training is that almost everything i'm doing is whatever you know i'm never really exceeding kind of 90 or 95 percent of my capacity so even if i'm having a bad day i've got the leeway of five or ten percent there to to still be able to like do the session hit the times um even though i'm kind of not on top form and yeah so it's kind of rare very rare that um I, I I miss sessions that I want to do, but it, yeah, it has happened. And when it has happened, it's not I'm in a bad way, uh, and I'm not. Go I'm yeah, I'm not going out to do it again. <laughs> I just trying to recall things in my you know because you know I remember I mean obviously Lance Armstrong's not a great example for all the reasons we know, but you know <laughs> he always talks about like, you know the quitting mentality and the fact the logic behind quitting is is there that I did so much of my career as a rugby player out of. The voice in my head saying, "Oh, you know, you haven't put the work and you haven't done this. You know, training. You know, training when I was supposed to be resting, over training. You know, train. If I went out a night out, waking up next morning, going to run the fitness off, always worried about being unfit. And mm. if I gave up, so for example, I'm talking about like a long day, like you, you know, not not as long as you, you know, with the kind of six hours of training. But that last part, of, say you're supposed to do some core, I was supposed to do some neck, or I was supposed to do an extra bit of fitness, or I went to do stretching." Those are the bits that you are so easy for you to go, well, I did the main part. I'm going to let that slide. And what would happen is I'd get inside and I just had the voice that would just say, come on, you know, you, you haven't fucking done a, you haven't finished a job. You haven't done this. You, you know, you didn't do that. And you've convinced yourself. Mm. And then because I knew, because you, because my dad taught me something when I was younger, you can lie to everyone else, but you can't lie to yourself. And obviously when what you do is sometimes, especially in lockdown, is an individual kind of discipline when you're not with your team. Um, you mm. and obviously the race in its health is individual because you're you know you're you're doing all the stuff without a team around you. Um, 
you know, nobody knows if you put work in other than you. And I just wondered if that had ever been the case. But it sounds like you're kind of quite at home with what you, the decisions you make because it's well programmed and because you're kind of you've bought into the the program. You're you're not allowing kind of this over emotion to to take control, really. Yeah, no, no, I I, um, I completely agree with what you're getting at. Um, and it is that is that kind of having that contract with yourself. Um, whereas I, I think for me, um, yeah, at times for sure, you know, I've got to the end of a session and thought I've done a great session, actually, I missed five minutes off the warm down or something, or, you know, I need to do a bit more of that, and I, and I won't do it. Um, I think I am actually quite clinical, <clears throat> and making the cut there and just saying, actually, you know, um, yeah, I don't need that. And I walk away and forget about it and not worry about it. Um, similar, I, I guess the thing is, one of the difficulties actually as a professional athlete, yeah, you know, for me, it's going swim, bike and running for you. Yeah, it was training. But actually, you could be at home at eight o'clock at night thinking, actually, should I need, do I need another 15 minutes on the foam roller or another 10 minutes stretching or, um, and so in that way, it is very much a kind of, you know, it could be a 24 seven job. And, and I think people some people struggle with that um, and having that contract with yourself, but you've got to have a draw the red line in the, in the sand somewhere, haven't you? And, and be like, no, actually, no, I have done all I can do for today. Um, you know, I need to put my feet up and relax or, or do something different. And um, yeah, I, I think they're, they're the same points. And yeah, drawing that line and thinking, right, you know, moving on. You know, a lot of people can't do that, draw that red line. Were you always able to do that? Because you sound so, because you sound so competitive. I'm actually surprised that you, I, I don't know what I was going to expect, but I didn't think you'd be kind of quite as resolute to be so like, I'm, you know, I'm into the system. This is what I do. If I draw a line on it, if I, if I, if I, for whatever reason, not quitting, but say injury, bike's not right, swimming's not right, you're not feeding it, you cut it and then you move on. Is that something you had to really work hard on? No, it wasn't something I worked too hard on. I think, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it can be a super competitive when I need to be. Um, I think for two reasons I can kind of move on. I think, I think the first one is that, um, and it's a, it's a you know super cliched adage in sport, is that the most important thing, you, you're maximizing yourself really, you're doing all that you can do. And um, I think for me, as long as I know that day or that week, you know, I've done the most, the best I can do that week effectively, um, I'm happy with that. And um, I think it's important kind of not to look, too much into you know what other people around you are doing and that's difficult and um i think that's got a lot more difficult in the last decade with more social media and stuff to be honest um you know 10 years ago uh, you had no idea effectively what your competitors were doing um the guy you know the very best guys as racing week in week out had no idea um and still and, and i think now you know with um people putting stuff on Instagram and like media apps like Strava effectively, you know exactly what someone's done and you think, oh, you know, someone did longer or further or faster than me today. Um, and so I think that is difficult. So yeah, that's why I tend to not kind of interact on that level so much. I think secondly, um, yeah, so really focus on myself. What can I do today and what have I done today to make the best of, of you know, super cliche, but true. Uh, I think the second thing is having that kind of structure um, and the accountability and I guess that contract with myself of what the week looks like and just knowing actually, yeah, this is pretty much the best I can do this week. This is maximizing myself, focus on doing this to the best of my ability, recovering me the sessions and, and doing that and then be happy with that. Um, and yeah, that, that's easy to say now. There's definitely points in my life where I've thought, oh, actually, you know, I can squeeze an extra 30 minute running here or an extra 30 minute running there um, and uh, and pushed it out. Um, and yeah, that's definitely true. The, the key in um, for me for endurance training is knowing when to push that boat out. Um, yeah, I can. Um, th there might be a few weeks I've been able to push extra training here or there, but there's only so many weeks you can do it uh, without it ending in injury um, and obviously being high risk. So doing that in periods in time and time and that's some form of uh, kind of just training progression, I guess, and periodization. But um, yeah, it, try, I try to be quite analytical about that. Um, and I guess that comes back to the kind of accountability in that contract with myself. And you said structure is important. And I, and I think when I was in a, in a team sport, some teams provided us with, or coaches provided us with the information, the timetable. So you knew what was happening. You didn't necessarily know the content of the days, but you knew what was happening. 
other coaches didn't give us that information. And I 100 percent mm. agree with you. Mm. Providing information for athletes and people is is important. I am surprised though about because the fact that you're you're essentially programming stuff for yourself. That um, I've seen some players that do the same stuff on a day, and you know, I mean, is is like Wednesday. Like, is there a day of the week that's the worst day for you? So yeah, I mean to talk about that um, kind of first point about programming. I mean, yeah. So the general week is the same. You know, I get up on a Wednesday. I know I'm going swimming. Um, it's a long, easy aerobic swim. Uh, I know I'm doing a run that's kind of 65, 70 minutes, just easy. And I know I'm doing a three and a half hour bike ride, just easy. Um, that's kind of not particularly programmed, but I do the same every Wednesday, and that is what it is. Um, when it comes to the specific sessions, like a, a session, swim session in the morning, um, the swim a swim coach writes that um, mostly just because they're the expert in it, and it means I get some different kind of input and don't have to think about it. Um, I find, and when it comes to a specific run session, like on a Tuesday, do a track session. Um, my run coach Mitch writes that session. Um, I think. It's quite important, actually, to for the key sessions because obviously they need a bit more input, a bit more thought about it, a bit more kind of periodization, um, and that's really important. Um, so you know that they're actually um, that they're actually kind of consciously developed. So yeah, I'm not really thinking about those most of the time, um, and also I kind of don't want to have to think about it and worry about it. I just want to turn up five minutes before and be told what the session is and go and do it. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I've always been because so you're not like obsessioning about it and worrying about it too too much just get on and, and do it at the time um, so yeah and but different people are definitely different than that people like to know the session in advance and give it some thought and be mentally prepared or whatever <laughs> no but I, I'm I'm like you so I just wondered when you said the structure week and thank you for kind of qualifying that because that was kind of my point is that obviously you know the, the, the periodization the fact you've got to peak at the right times you're working on different development developmental areas but actually I'm one of these people that I would rather not know turn up and mm -hmm. go right uh, be prepared for whatever and get on with it because if you told me, for example, when I was doing my MMA stuff, preparing for my first fight, you know, I knew that my first sparring session in the cage, which was basically a full-on tear-up, was going to be on this Tuesday. So basically, on Saturday, mm. you know, when they told me Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, it was all I thought about. Sunday night sleep, you know, mm. the night before, I couldn't get my head around it because it was my first kind of fight in a cage. Right? It was about, you know, we're going to kick fuck out of each other, and this is what, you know, I've never done that before. And it kind of, mm. it filled me up with that. So it's, it's interesting that you say that for those kind of key developmental ones, when you're going to go balls to the wall or something, someone else is, is, is structured for you, really. And that's how you, I think, probably get the best out of yourself, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that is how I get the best out of myself. I, I was just interested when you were saying, you know, you were kind of super stressed about the run-up to your yeah, MMA stuff. What, was that different to your rugby playing days you know was it you know the biggest matches surely that was like nerve-wracking the night before and do you know what it what it was i and i'm i'm gonna you know i'm gonna ask you this a little bit later on but i when i worked with a sports psychologist since the age of kind of 18 i i had um i had some confidence issues around my, my ability and stuff and i was you know it was quite hard on myself and you know focusing on negativity but also one of the byproducts of working with her was how to prepare you know when you're pl when you're trying to peak every weekend playing 30 40 games a season you can't do 30 40 games on emotion you can't do 30 40 games you know because you're bound to feel tired injured have a row with your missus have a row with your partner be stressed not mm. being not in form out of form whatever um and how did you how do you can, can consistently prepare and i and i went through a phase of kind of always listening to music so if i turned up to the game as i said earlier what anything else that could be happening in my world as soon as i put my headphones on and walked off the bus i was in it i was in that mode and, I, and I, you obviously have to keep up, keep updating your music to have that emotive effect the next thing was i used to watch highlight reels of myself playing or doing stuff for that motivation that then morphed into me watching guys like Richie McCaw play um, as motivation of what level I wanted to achieve. He was the best in my eyes. How could I, mm. how could I get there? And by the end of it, in some, and by the time I'd finished my career, the best, some of the best, I was watching Dave Chappelle, Chappelle. I was watching Ricky Gervais on the bus, you know, before I put my headphones mm. on because I was completely relaxed. Um, and I would know that I would derive confidence from doing my extra work. So my whole career, as I said, I, you know, I did things out, certain things out mm. of fear, but I spent every, after every session, 
doing you know 15 20 minutes of extra work on a specific skill so you know um mm. you know whatever you know whether it's passing tackling footwork running catching whatever mm. um and uh, i would do that and that would mean that in the, when i came to the game i'd have a few goals and i would i would feel confident and it wouldn't be a problem with the mma it was the actual unknown it was the fact that i'm going into a cage with you know a, a, another 120 kg guy that you know emotionally had done mm. nothing to me uh, and you know this was going to be a full-on fight, and, and I know that the guys in the shoot fighters mm. and other shoot fighters were, were putting me in that ring, a uh, cage, to test to see whether was I fanny, like was was I going to get punched in the face and be like, I actually don't want to be here, you know, because you see people who have had a fight before, or never had a fight before, they they turn their head away, they pat their shout shy away. It turns out mm. I actually don't mind a tear up. I'm not <laughs> I'm not any good at it, but I do, mm. you know, I don't mind it. But it was the fact that I was unable to sleep, and that was. I was more nervous about going into that new new arena than I was anything else. And I actually still get it in regards to DJ, you know, like run out 80,000 people at Twickenham, do these kind of things. Playing, you know, 200 people or 5,000 people as a DJ gig, because it's the unknown, because I'm not in my comfort zone, because it's, mm. because it's execution of a skill that I am not overly comfortable with, it, it, um, that's mm. where you, you get the fear. Because I wonder now, like, you know, you said obviously how many kind of, um, you know the 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 World Series you want and stuff like. I imagine there's that nervous intensity before those performances because you know how hard you're gonna have to push your body, and that can make you feel nervous. Or do you, do you still get that? Yeah, um, I think yeah is is a easy answer to that. Um, you know that it's gonna be hard. You know that it's gonna be painful. Um, and actually, I don't mind that. You know, I guess I find myself just hoping before the race and just you know just uh being like yeah please as long as the body feels good and that kind of pain is like good pain and you know everything's working and actually i'm happy with that I, I actually don't mind that you know trying to run faster than the guy next to me and the body's hurting but everything's working and is working as well as it could i'm completely happy in in that that space if you're having a bad day and it's kind of bad hard um if that makes sense hopefully it makes sense to people then that's the real yeah that's the thing i don't enjoy because um it's just kind of a really negative miserable experience so i guess that's the thing i'm nervous about um and that is somewhat of a uncontrollable just you know waking up the wrong side of bed diving in to start a swim and you just know you haven't got it that day um and yeah i'm nervous about that um but yeah i think uh i i can kind of completely relate to what you're saying not only in terms of experiences that are out my comfort comfort zone that you get nervous with but also actually if i've been away you know if i haven't actually competed that much or if i know that i'm a bit injured or a bit under you know under fit and i'm throwing myself in a race i'm way more nervous than i would be if i then if i'm throwing myself in a race and i'm I'm super fit and you know i know i'm on top of it i know i'm in a great place for a good result um because yeah like you said you're, you're standing on that start line um in, in a place that you're not you're not comfortable with because you're not comfortable with your your physical preparation and condition. What are the triggers that you can use to tell whether you're fit or not? Like I know, I know it might sound obvious in, in times and stuff, but sometimes I thought that I was really unfit, and it might be because I was slightly dehydrated or I'd had a bad day, or because because my, my simple mind used to think you could just get fit and unfit. Like obviously forgetting that it, it does take a bit of bit of a bit of time. What do you what do you use to go? I'm I'm ready. I'm not ready. I think we all fall into that trap. You know, uh, we fall in the trap of thinking. One day, yeah, I'm flying, and then you have a couple of bad days, and you think, no, you know, I'm really unfit. Um, so yeah, every, everyone's definitely been there. I, I for me, um, I mean, yeah, it's times of sessions. You know, I go to the pool, I swim 100 meter reps or whatever. I, you know, almost anything. I kind of know how fast I should be swimming and what that should feel like and what I should be able to do. Yeah, running on the track, I kind of know what that that feels like, and cycling in terms of a power meter, I kind of know what that is um so yeah a combination of those things um over a period of time not doing it as a one-off doing it as a yeah over a few weeks um because yeah you can have sessions where you have an absolutely blinding session but it doesn't necessarily mean you're in in great form combination of those things yeah and again um i, I liked what you said in terms of you got a lot of confidence from doing those extra 20 minutes at the end of sessions at, I've kind of always had this um, feeling as well that real confidence comes from work at the end of the day and actually any other confidence that doesn't come from work is is kind of false confidence and isn't helpful. Uh, and so, yeah, I think 
um, it ties in like, you know, my fitness and physical condition is also, I guess, being good, having been in a good place mentally and they're kind of one and the same, you know, I know um, if I've put in, you know, months and months of, of good work and it's gone well, um, physically I'm good, mentally, you know, I, I guess I'm confident that that kind of leads to conviction in in my ability of going out and performing um and it like is a bit of a feedback loop that comes back around to physically performing well um and i think all of those combined um really so yeah it's not one there's not one uh one thing and even you know i've won races and known i've not been that fit um and i've lost races and known i have been really fit so it is it's kind of a bit of a a, a moving beast <laughs> I know when I see things on the board, what, what level I'm going to have to get to, because once you set a certain standard, like you can't just have a go at it. It's not like a 50% job. It's, it's like a, you know, a 90 to hundred percent job. And that's what gets me. And sometimes I'll be able to peak. And then I think, Oh, I'm fit now, but maybe that was a good day. Whereas actually I quite like the fact you've been doing it for so long. You have those kind of data points. Everything you keep saying is I know what my, my level has to be in a pool. I give myself 90 to 95 or I give myself 5%. And it's kind of a really good way to do it as opposed to what people do is over-focus on, a, on, on, a, on emotion. You know, is that something, you, again, you talk with just because of the nature of the three disciplines you do, you're constantly setting scores and coaches are recommending you do that. Yeah, I mean, I guess... At the base, it is quite analytical. Um, yeah, you know, how fast can I swim? And you're swimming up and down a 25 meter length all the time. How fast can I swim four lengths? How fast can I swim eight lengths? Uh, whatever. Uh, and you're doing that a lot, you know, swimming thousands of lengths uh, a week. So, yeah, one way to make it interesting is to make it analytical. But also, yeah, you want to be able to track. And, um, yeah, you know, a lot of my kind of thinking around triathlon is, um, I guess it use this word like efficiency. So it's not actually always how fast I can go, but you know, a lot of the time you do want to go as fast as you can. It's actually how easy can I do a certain pace or a certain speed um, because you want to get through the swim as easy as you can. And in the top five, effectively, you want to get through the bike as easy as you can compared to other people. So yeah, that if you do define that, that's efficiency. So quite often I'm swimming up and down as well. Um, and I guess this is where it's a bit emotional, kind of qualitative rather than purely quantitative. But um, I'm, I'm swimming a set speed. How easy can I swim this speed? Um, and yeah, and, and that's that's really important as well. Um, and, and trying to be efficient and effective at, at doing that speed. Um, so and then I guess you're covering kind of a range of efforts and paces because in a triathlon, you know, you in just take a swim, for example, actually the first two or 300 meters is about as fast as you can go because you're getting out there you know you're swimming as fast as you can to try and get near the front of the field but after that it's how good i'm i swimming at, at yeah like i said this kind of set kind of pace and they might sound the same they might sound the faster you can go you know the more effective you are at swimming um a speed but they're not the same and and so you it's you're trying to look at um kind of fitness to do a range of things and um, that's where I think the pure kind of analytics, the what we'd call the science part of it, um, it's not necessarily that scientific um, kind of blends into the more qualitative, um, uh, slightly less scientific side of it. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's not as quantifiable as you as you think. But yeah, I, I guess compared to what you your you, what you did in terms of passing and passing accuracy, um, even that is a is a it's kind of a lot more quantitative than that. Did you, um, at the start of every season, dismantle what you did to then rebuild it to, to improve that efficiency? I never uh, did a whole scale um, dismantle of anything. I, I kind of believe in kind of gradual change, um, you know, change one or two things at a time, see whether that happens. Um, don't make big changes um, because, you know, if something works, don't don't significantly change it uh just try and maximize little bits around the edges so that yeah that was effectively the philosophy um yeah if i try and do an extra swim session does that help me or if i try and do an extra run here does that actually help me or not um or yeah right down to the technical uh if i make this change to my swimming stroke what impact does that actually have on my ability to swim fast ability to swim at this pace 
kind of constantly trying to make those adjustments, um, which, yeah, I mean, you can't always do in, in a very quantitative way. You, you're just trying to feel it, you know, literally feel it as you go along. Is there one of the three disciplines that you've, that you've tweaked something that's given you a whole different level of efficiency? Over the years, all three of them, actually. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think another thing uh, <laughs> that you can probably relate to is that actually your body as a, as a machine, as an engine, is a moving target. You know, you're not training the same body this year as I was training last year or the year before, you know. Definitely, as I'm uh, as I've got a bit older into my 30s, that's that's changed as well. I I basically can't train train the same way as I did four, five, six years ago or ten years ago, and and so that you know, the engine changes as well. So you're trying to kind of adapt um, for for the current engine and, and chassis you've got in terms of your body, um, and yeah, so something that worked um, ten years ago in, in terms of an efficiency like um, yeah, do really fast running reps. Um, basically, doesn't work for me anymore because that I kind of think that's anecdotally I think that's a really high injury risk. So don't do that. So if you're not doing really fast running reps, how can you get a similar uh, effect without doing that? And that's obviously doing slightly longer, slower reps. Um, and and that's the difference. And th- yeah, that's kind of a simple I guess example of something that I've tried, but is the base of it. Is Doing what you do as all-consuming as it seems, like you said, six hours training today. Is it? Is there any space for anything else, or is it every every waking moment of every day? Uh, no, it's not every waking moment of every day. Uh, you know, even within six hours, you've got a fair bit of time to do other stuff like podcasts. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, yeah, six hours is. I mean, you can work ten or twelve hour days if you want. So yeah, I'm, it's great. I. I um, do a, a combination of lots of other things and uh, things to to relax as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm lucky to have other other motivations. And I think actually for uh, for my sport, it's actually really important for me personally to have other things going on, other things to think about, other focuses. Um, and yeah, I, probably actually linking back to what we we're talking about earlier in that sport is all, all consuming and. Actually, you know, if you're not doing something else, would I be sat there thinking, uh, is that another reason I'd be sat there thinking, yeah, I should be nipping out for another 60 minutes of running here. Um, by put, having other focuses in life, I think, um, yeah, that, that's a really good reason um, to, to, yeah, just change, change track a bit on an evening and, um, yeah, move on from sport. Do you know what? I'm so impressed you said that because one of the biggest lessons I learned through my career was that having balance in other areas of your life and not living the every emotional moment through your sport. Because if imagine you have your private life and your sport. If your private life's shit and your sport's mm-hmm. going shit, what else have you got? But if you have a diversification, you have mm-hmm. other interests and passions and hobbies that, that, are, that are yours that cannot necessarily be affected by stuff, you then suddenly have balance. And for my entire career, I got criticised for doing too much stuff outside, but it meant I was more focused mm-hmm. on what I was doing because I then structured my day to do that that was my priority but once that was done I was able to move on and I think it's fascinating and I know like, like a lot of young players and people listen to it mm. and you know if someone of your caliber says that I I I'm so relieved because mm. I before I you know what I've read, read about you and what I've seen and obviously you know I'm a fan of yours and stuff I see on TV I would have thought that everything about you was so calculated on what you did that you hadn't allowed to have other space but at the very fact you said that um were you were you always like that or is that something you've you've had to kind of learn or, or just organically discovered uh, yeah i think always uh, pretty like that you know I, I kind of did my studies alongside my career um and yeah that was an important part my uh, parents and my my coach um at the time was really keen you know right up to the point where i um I, even when I'd won the world championship as a senior and finished a one degree, my coach was like, no, you're not ready to be a full-time professional athlete going to a master's. Uh, so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, to an extent, I've always had other stuff. Um, I think one of the real benefits of um, lockdown has yeah, given me space to yeah, work out other things that I want to do and, and take on kind of other projects. And I completely agree. I think um, not only is it good for that kind of, post-career planning that we all know as athletes is potentially fraught with difficulties and complications but I think it's good uh, at the time I think for two reasons I think it's good exactly like you just said to have other focuses um, have other things going on in your life other ways of um, kind of 
you know, I guess setting and defining your self worth because that, like you said, if if your sports going crap and it's all consuming, um, that's a pretty pretty tough place to be, and it might be all consuming for reasons like injury or whatever, you know, things that you haven't necessarily controlled. Um, but also, I, I do I think there's real value, and I, I've kind of seen research into this um, that uh, you know there's and I talk a little bit about it in the book. There's there's a lot of value in having that post career planning, and it just makes it makes sense, doesn't it? Obvious sense, you know if if I know I've got something to go to post career and that's kind of taken care of and I'm, I'm kind of happy with that, I can put more focus into my training today and tomorrow because I'm, I'm not worried about what I might be doing in five years time um, post career. And I think that's, that's really important as well. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, in sport, in, in my sporting career, and you you said the same thing, go back 10 years. I, I think that, that kind of attitude was like, no, absolutely not. You need to be completely focused on what you're doing and anything else is a distraction. And I think that's rapidly changed and um, it is rapidly changing to having this point of view of other stuff, other focuses um, are, are important and actually positive for performance today, not just a, you know, not just a good thing. Can you tell me, I mean, I don't know if you've talked about it openly, can you, you've got an idea what you want to do when you retire? Uh, yeah, a combination of lots of things, I think. Uh yeah, it's important. I, I, you know, I always hoped, I always had this dream of like, uh, and kind of told my friends, yeah, I'm gonna just enjoy riding my bike and do this and that. But in reality, I'm not the kind of person who can do that. <laughs> I'm gonna need always to have something going on. So yeah, a combination of things. Um, yeah, of various. We, Johnny and I have uh, got a charity, so I'd like to do a lot more of that. Um, various uh, business interests and and and, and things. Uh, and most importantly, do all the crazy sporting events that I haven't had the chance to do yet. So, you know, I'd love to do um, like ultra running, like Tour of Mont Blanc and um, yeah, climb some mountains and all those kind of things that I haven't been able to do because I'm a professional athlete. So I look forward to that. To that. I want to I want to come on to those because I know you've got something to do with the, the Ironman thing. I just bring it back to kind of your life. Have you are you saying you've, have you managed to sustain friendships? Um, you know, within that thing, and also, you know, my I was talking to my wife um, before I came on about that, and she said, "I wonder, you know, for the sport of your nature, you know, she found it very hard being my partner because she was never going to come first in 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 life, not in any other area before we get crude. Uh, was never going to come first in terms of of um, you know my career because I, I had to put it first because it was only a lim- a time limit on it. I mean, have you managed to keep friendships? Have you allowed room? If, you know, do you have a partner? Um, yeah, I have um, kept friendships. I guess a lot of the thing is that uh, in life, I've uh, a lot of my friends actually are through sport, and um, you know, not guys necessarily who I do it on an elite level, like you know that I've been out with today or anything, but people that I first met when I was kind of running as a actually as a kind of a ten year old and going out cycling um, with local guys and stuff. So. Yeah, I guess a lot of my friends are through sports, so so they've got a, a, an understanding of it already. And actually, um, you know, a lot of my training, you know, like I said, it's no great hardship. In normal times, if I'd be out this afternoon for a number of hours on a bike ride, I'll be riding with a group of guys. You know, some I might train with most days, others I might see every couple of weeks. And so it is quite a, ever a kind of social thing. Um, and so yeah, I've been lucky enough to to have friendships. Um, yeah, I think uh, everyone knows probably around me that a lot of the time sport has to come first. So the number of over the years, yeah, whatever nights at the pub, uh, weddings, whatever you know that I've missed, parties that I've missed, um, yeah, they're all. I've I've never really looked at them as sacrifices. You know, or they've always been um, decisions that I've made that uh, to you know positive performance decisions. I guess is how you could put it. Um, rather than making a, a sacrifice, and um, that yeah, that's always been a yeah a real important way I've looked at it. And yeah, I uh, yeah I do have a a girlfriend who's obviously very understanding that on the whole um, sport comes first. <laughs> but but does she understand? Because because I you know my wife is, is unbelievable. You know she has supported me and goes above and beyond. But it, if you're not from that world, to, still trying to comprehend what it's like and the, the sacrifices and the, and the single minded determination. If you're not there, it's hard to comprehend. There must, there must be a few conversations every now and then of like, fuck's sake, Alistair, like what, you know, 
when when am I when is it gonna, my time? And what I told her is real time will come in retirement. Now I'm even bu- more busy in retirement than I ever was playing. So she's still <laughs> she's still got the hump. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, it's a, di- a difficult one, isn't it? I, I think um, I've always been very uh, binary with you know with, with kind of everyone in my life. To be honest, of like um, yeah, this is this is what I do. This is who I am. Um, I, I I train hard, work hard. That you know from that is what I am and I, you know I've definitely never been anywhere near kind of hiding it um, from anyone around me um, and yeah I, I think that's the key to it just being a lot, a lot of a lot of clarity I've never been to the point really um, with anyone really of saying yeah you know this is what it is for the moment for this year or next year but it's going to be different at some point because yeah, I mean, I might, um, I'll still be doing sport to some extent in five or six years' time. And, and like you said, for all the jokes I like to make, if I just want to go and ride my bike in the sun every day for fun, um, yeah, I, I think uh, whatever I'm doing after sport, I'll be reasonably busy doing as well. So. so I've been talking to you for just an hour. You, you know, you're obviously a very intelligent guy. You've obviously got a lot of lot of things going on and lots of aspects. You're going to be even busier when you finish playing. So I'd keep selling her the dream now, mm-hmm. but just, you know, yeah. all you've got to do is at least just make sure you send the flowers every now and then and, and you know, and, and or, or hopefully she, you know, she probably works. I just keep making sure my wife keeps working and does stuff. I'm like, like, why don't you develop this idea? Why don't you develop this idea? And then for a week, mm-hmm. she'll go, I, you know, I haven't seen you all week. And I was like, yeah, but maybe you were working so hard. And she goes, I was, I was. <laughs> and that's, and that's how I, that's how I get, over, get away with it. Um, I, I want to talk a little. <laughs> Button. Thanks for the advice. Yeah, it's the best way of doing it, honestly, mate. Because you'd be stuffed. Like you, when you, if you talk about charity with your brother, business interests, preparing for Ironman, Mont Blanc climbing. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless you get her on the Ironman stuff, you you know, you're gonna have to. She'll still be standing there with a water bottle, going, "Come on, Alistair, come on, mate. It's, it's no good." Um, yeah. I want to talk to you about about your 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 book. I know we've been talking for for an hour, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I am fascinated. You've you got a book coming out uh, on the 8th of July, uh, 2021, called uh, Relentless Secrets of the Sporting Elites. And you've talked to people like Ronnie O'Sullivan, Alistair Cook, Paul Radcliffe, Ian Botham, uh, Michael Owen and Shane Williams, just to name a few, um, about kind of what makes them tick. Do you want to tell us quickly about, about the book and, and the idea behind it? Yeah, so the idea of the book actually came quite a long time ago. Um, it started off with my fascination of sport. You know, I've always uh, loved watching sport, following sport, being part of sport my entire life. Um, and I, I guess um, one, there was one particular uh, kind of uh, crux of this, and it happened, um, I did something called Superstars on BBC um, after the Olympics in 2012 that I was useless at, by the way. But uh, there was a combination, you know, all kinds of athletes there from, uh, yeah, rowers to a, a shooter to... Um, athletes, Mo Farah did it, um, and and any and Anthony Joshua. Um, so you know, we kind of sat around, and I just thought it was absolutely fascinating, actually, how similar um, a lot of our kind of outlooks and perceptions and stuff were in in lots of actually lots of areas. You know, there, there could be a load in common between my training in terms of a really focused six to eight weeks of training um, with a, the guys of double trap shotgun shooter, and then you know, in other ways, obviously things are completely different. Um, and that that was a long time ago and, and obviously fantastic, you know, met all kinds of sporting people over the years and, and genuinely been fascinated and interesting about what makes them tick, how they approach things, um, yeah, you know, what they've learned, uh, how they would do things differently, what advice they could give to me, um, all these things and yeah, had the opportunity to go about um, talking to all these people and and writing it into a book and um yeah it was a, it's been a, a fantastic project and um i hope people enjoy reading it as much as uh i've, I've enjoyed talking to people and and uh thinking about it did you lose my phone number in there because i saw you talk to shane and stuart lancaster i obviously did my <laughs> did my agent say i was unavailable or something because i it's okay I can, is it too late to put a little do you want to put I'll a I sent you loads of messages. I think, uh, yeah, I think you must have been under the thumb that week or uh, something. I don't know. That, do you know what? If, if you'd said it was anything else, people might have doubted you. The very fact you said it was under the thumb, exactly. That is exactly where I was. Well, listen, if you do a book two and you want to talk to sort of not quite elite sportsmen, yeah. but people had a good time and a bit of chat, I'm, I'm up for that. Um, <laughs> what did you, what did you, 
I mean, without revealing too much of it, because I want people to buy the book. Cause, but I think people, you know, having listened to you and the way the things that make you tick, they're definitely going to do that. Um, were there a couple of common themes like that you that, that united all of you? Yeah, well, I mean, I must admit. So my first idea for the book would I'd have this really clinical, you know, whatever twelve chapters. One would be on motivation. One would be on conviction. One would be on obsession. You know, etc. These kind of terms that we all associate with elite sporting people. And yeah, I mean, obviously you talk to Paula Ratcliffe and Chris Froome and Ronnie and, you know, all these things come out, like motivation, obsession, uh, you, you know, willpower, a lot of the things we've talked about. It's really easy to kind of bring those um, bring, bring those perspectives out. But what I realised when I kind of talked to people and started thinking about it and started kind of writing some ideas was actually... It, the stories behind a lot of the things were, you know, were really interesting. Um, and so I actually changed the structure of the book to kind of tie people that I thought were interesting together in chapters. And that would be, um, of you know, there's so many fascinating things about Ronnie O'Sullivan. I was fascinated. You know, I stand on the start line, for example, thinking if I dive in here and something goes wrong in the first 10 seconds, I've got two, out, two hours to sort it out. Um, and that's that's that. You know, I was fascinated to know what it's like if, Every time he sets up um, with a cue, you know, every time he's lining up the shot, that could potentially be a massive, you know, that could mess his game up. And just in that half a second and that focus every time, and he's going through it hundreds of times in a game, um, you know, how does he cope with that compared to my strategy of, you know, dive in and once I'm racing and racing, I only have to do it once. And if I mess it up, it doesn't matter that much anyway. Um, and going and sit, sitting down actually in his mum's house who made us dinner that night and we, you know, we, I think ate lasagna and had a chat over the dinner table and that was that. And I kind of, that, that was interesting to me. So I thought, you know, write a bit, a bit about that. Um, and similar to, there's a, a really famous Yorkshire cyclist, uh, called Beryl Burton, who a lot of people haven't, probably haven't heard of, but was a real trailblazer in the cycling world, a, a, a female cyclist in the 60s, incredible story of a, a woman who um, worked on a rhubarb farm during the week and uh, was basically beating the men on, in cycling events on the weekend, was pretty much the best cyclist in the world. Um, and she, she unfortunately passed away, but I went for a bike ride with her daughter on the Beryl Burton um, Cycle Network, which is obviously named after her, and we cycled along on a, on a sunny summer afternoon just chatted about a mum and I, I thought actually um yeah it's kind of anecdotes and human interest stories around obviously the trying to tease out the interesting um sporting uh, bits about it that that I enjoyed and um so the book became a little bit more about that and um and kind of changed the structure did anyone really surprise you I know and, I, and I, I'll, I'll phrase that in terms of you know, someone like Usain Bolt, right? And knowing his Olympic story, there's always that like fabrication. All he ate was McDonald's, and the very fact he's kind of been bastardized is from what he said. It was he didn't trust the food necessarily, and he wanted to just eat before the race because he knew he wanted to um, to have something clean. He wanted to trust what was putting into his body. It wasn't the fact he lived on McDonald's and ran the fastest time. But were there anybody that you spoke to that was just like, yeah, I just fucking just get on with it, or some or something really surprising, or that they were so like hugely superstitious or something like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, one of the real, I guess, not surprises because it's kind of ignorance on my part, but there's so much we come across in sport. It's really obvious when you talk to Ronnie, but a, a lot of these guys, you know, they get labelled as geniuses. And kind of asking that question of, um, yeah, do you think you're genius? What do you feel when you get described as that? Uh, and you know, his answer was, yeah, actually quite pissed off. Like, you know, genius kind of doesn't, um, doesn't hint to the fact that I spend hours on the practice table and, um, you know, working on it, working on that skill, training, working hard towards it. Um, yeah, I guess the kind of veracity of his answer to those questions kind of surprised me because, you know, straight away, if I asked you, Ronnie O'Sullivan, genius, like we all do it. And, uh, you know, even as sports people, we do it and, you know, uh, and it just completely covers up for me, um, yeah, the background work behind it. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was surprising. Um, I think some people's, uh, yeah, simplicity of some people's approach, yeah, just get on and, and do it. And uh, that's that, you know, uh, I think quite often we look, you know, we actually, we, you know, we kind of 
overcomplicate things and yeah there's a scientific approach to that or this or and 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 that's the kind of story we get told and that's interesting that's what we all want to see but um 99.9 percent of actually that was just hard work like simple hard work uh and yeah there's the bells and whistles the fancy bits of that last one or point one percent but that is only that and most of it is is the simple grind of doing repeating the same thing over and over again so you just get flipping good at it (laughs) did you find anyone couldn't articulate why they were good because some some people is genius or whatever we want to call them don't know why they're good they just they just get on with it you know that that maybe their natural talent outweighs anything else yeah uh, i i think at the bottom it no one really knows actually why they're good um because it's really easy to say you know why are you really good at what you do? I train harder and prepare better than anyone else. Well, how do you know you train harder than anyone else? How do you know you prepare better? Do you do you like train alongside all those people? Do you know what they're doing twenty four hours a day? No. <laughs> <You're struggling. laughs> yeah, so no one knows that. You know, every time someone says I work harder, you don't really know you work harder. Um so no one knows and so I think there's that. So the interesting thing there is well why does someone think that they're good you know and ultimately it's a combination of working hard look uh you know genetic talent um you know look in terms of being in the right time at the right place meeting the right people the right coach at the right time um or you know all, all those all those factors and yeah the i i I learned, I think, a lot from actually asking people and, and listening to the answer to that question. Of, and what you're really learning is, you know, we all know why people are good at sport. They train a lot. They train hard. Uh, you know, they've got great advice. They do the little things, like you said, that other people might not do. Um, and most of those little things work for them somehow in, in some way. Um, and it's a combination of all those things. That It's an interesting question, though, to to find out why someone how they prioritize those uh, aspects did you take anything out yourself out of all of that and suddenly think you know what i haven't been doing that i need to do that or did it did it just refresh you of what the things you needed to do i think uh, a lot of it is it refreshed um the things that i need to do um and it just um yeah i guess the big refresher was just a belief in doing the little things right um and actually passion for it because i think so much of um high performance sporting environment across any sport is the passion for it because that encompasses your ability to work hard it encompasses you know doing the little things right it encompasses trying to get lots of good nights sleep and eating well um and for me yeah i think um we we all have like ups and downs with that you know we have times when yeah we're absolutely on it things are going well and we have times when actually yeah you're just kind of not there um and yeah it it kind of hearing all these people be, I guess being inspired is the word for it it's inspired that passion that um you know maybe I might not have been ha- had as kind of as, it been as good a place as I had 10 years ago um kind of really kind of reinvigorated that did anybody them or you talk about the psychological side and the, and the psychological work they did because I firmly believe that that out of all the things we do is the most under-focused on area, especially in rugby. It's something that just, you know, if you put your hand up, when I first started, I said I went to a sports psychologist, I was probably the only one in the room who, who would have spoken to someone. And I thought it's the, it's my, it was the biggest, my personal biggest area of development. Did that come out of them? Was there any talk of that? Yeah, talked about various psychological interventions, what people believed um, with almost all, with almost all of them. Uh, and yeah, the opinions raised a change from, um, I think, Ian Botham, uh, to not quote him directly, was it's a load of effing rubbish or something along those lines. Um, the, the Ronnie who said, um, yeah, working with Steve Peters has basically sorted my career out um, and everything in between. And, um, yeah, that interesting, um, yeah, interesting opinions. And, yeah, I, you know, I found that interesting. I, I've had, you yeah, know, seen experiences of things working really well, of, uh, you know this belief that you spend loads of time training your body why shouldn't you spend time training your mind um, to different times I've thought if it ain't broke don't fix it um, and, and everything in between myself as well so yeah I was fascinated to learn perspectives on is, that. Is it something you look into? I know you said at times you've gone through that circle but is it an area of mm-hmm. development? Do you have someone on your team that you that you 
you know go to for this kind of stuff i've never uh gone externally to it in terms of yeah finding someone to help me with it um i guess you, you know I, i've done lots of things all along to uh develop my own kind of psych psychology from everything from yeah how do i make myself super focused to yeah how do i stand on the start line in the best possible um kind of head condition to yeah how do i um help myself relax better so yeah i guess it's yeah, if you asked me this question like five or six years ago, I probably would have gone no, no. But actually, there are a lot of things that I, and I guess learning, hearing other people talk about what they do, there are a lot of things that I kind of worked out um, to suit me uh, as I've gone along. I think um, and read books and stuff about, uh, and, and just kind of come across, I guess, kind of organic interventions in my own way rather than um, finding someone to help me do it mate listen I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you I think you're a fascinating guy you're obviously an incredible athlete um, your book Relentless Secrets of the Sporting Elite is out uh, on the 8th of July um, can people pre-order it now anywhere yeah you can pre-order it uh, I think we've it's definitely Amazon, but I think good bookshops. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Amazon, Amazon the go-to, but we can't let that global conglomerate take everything because you can get it independently. I think probably all in W. H. Smith potentially and elsewhere. Um, if people want to follow on social media, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, on Instagram uh, and Twitter. Uh, Ali Brownley try um, is my handle, and Alistair dot Brownley, I think. Um, but I'm sure you can find me if you look me up. <laughs> That's uh, what a flanker. The podcast uh, series two uh, that was talking to Alistair Brownie. If you want to subscribe and share this podcast, then please do remember it's also a video podcast on YouTube and pick up a copy of my book, What a Flanker, as it's out now in paperback. Mm-hmm.